Okay, welcome and good afternoon. Um, this will be the first in the uh, series that we've been meaning to kick off for Carbon Cycle 2.0 for about the last year and now have finally done it uh, on big questions in, in energy and energy science. And our guest today is Mark Zoback from Stanford University. Many of you, I think, know him. And it's my pleasure to uh, say a few words about him before we get started. Benjamin M. Page, professor of geophysics at Stanford. His research uh, is conducted on in situ stress, fault mechanics, and reservoir geomechanics. You could easily claim that Mark is the world's foremost authority on stress in rocks in the Earth's crust. And um, fracking, as he will explain probably, is there's a business of creating stress in the Earth's crust, and that is one of the reasons that Mark is an expert in this area. He's also very interested in natural gas uh, in production, and um, as everyone knows, and I think Mark will, will confirm, if you have an environmental or energy problem, natural gas is the answer. Maybe, right? But then one man's solution is another man's problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so Mark uh, is uh, uh, very highly regarded. He's also very accomplished and has published a lot. He's uh, published a textbook on reservoir geomechanics. He's the author or co-author of 300 technical papers. He's gotten numerous awards, including the Emil uh, uh, Bichert Medal of the German Geophysical Society and the Walter H. Bucher Medal from the American Geophysical Union. And in 2011, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. He's been on some recent uh, National Academy committees uh, investigating the Deepwater Horizon accident and also on uh, the Secretary of Energy's Committee on Shale Gas Development and Environmental Protection. So it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome Mark uh, as our inaugural speaker in this series. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. It, it's nice to be back. Um, I believe I was here about two years ago, two or three years ago, talking about a, a similar topic. And what I want to do now is, is kind of talk about some of these scientific challenges uh, that my students and I have been addressing, not by any means all that we're doing or not by any means all that needs to, needs to be done. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, uh, as all of you know, there's just been a tremendous amount of activity in North America concerning producing natural gas from shales, organic, rich, clay-rich geologic formations. The areas in red are the, the shale gas basins. Those in green are areas where oil is being produced using similar technologies. And the kind of greenish-reddish color are uh, where both uh, liquid and gas hydrocarbons are, are being, being produced. At consumption rates uh, of just a couple years ago, the um, estimated recovery uh, would, in fact, last 100 years, as, as many of you have heard. Now, in the next 10 years, you know, we're going to drill thousands of wells, and we're going to do hundreds of thousands of hydraulic fracturing operations to extract this gas. And so I think the two really critical questions are how to optimize the resource development, and simultaneously, how do we minimize the environmental impact of that development? Globally, uh, this, sh this shale gas story is equally uh, exciting. This is uh, about a year and a half old from uh, uh, EIA. 22,600 TCF of gas in place. Uh, rule of thumb is perhaps 25% is uh, technically recoverable. At uh, 160 TCF per year, the current consumption rate, that would last about 35 years. But notice in this analysis, the Middle East is left out, left out Russia is left out, uh, Africa, and, and many other parts of the world. So this is a lower bound estimate. Um, Baker Hughes is a company I, I do some consulting for, and they've prepared this estimate, um, including now Russia, uh, the Middle East, Africa, and some of the areas in gray on the previous map. And the numbers are very impressive, um, about 11,000 that should be an FTCF, technically recover recoverable gas, or about 70 years at current consumption levels. Um, and again, this is a conservative estimate. So there's a lot of natural gas out there. And where I want to wind up this talk at the end, just so you know where I'm going, is to talk about natural gas 
as uh, you know, the cliche goes, a, uh, a blue bridge to a green future. You know, 100 years of natural gas isn't really very much if we double the use of natural gas, say, to replace coal, that's 50, if we start exporting some of it, if we start using it for transportation. So, you know, we're starting to talk about 30, 40 years before we know about it. So that's not very far. So let's think about natural gas, or at least I think about natural gas as something that is extremely important to about mid-century. But there's got to be something on the other side of that bridge, and let's not lose sight of that. Now, as um, those of you who know anything about this topic know it all started in the Barnett Shale. The Barnett Shale is the Dallas-Fort Worth area of uh, north central Texas. And uh, during the first part of this century, there was just a tremendous increase in the number of wells being drilled and the amount of gas being produced as industry transitioned from the classical technology of drilling a vertical well and then putting a big fat hydraulic fracture in it when they were dealing with low permeability rocks. Now what I mean by a big fat hydraulic fracture is a fracture that was propagated with a very viscous gel carrying as much sand as you could get it to, to carry to create as much surface area between a permeable fracture plane and a relatively impermeable rock. As hydraulic fracturing came along, hydraulic fractures were initially made along the entire length of the well, in this case drilled in the direction of maximum horizontal compression so that the, the fracture would propagate perpendicular to that. And then eventually the technology was to turn the well, drill it parallel to the direction of minimum horizontal stress, and create a series of horizontal fractures, excuse me, uh, a series of parallel fractures perpendicular to the least principal stress. So this is called multi-stage fracturing, and that's the technology that you know, really cracked the code, allowed commercial quantities of natural gas to be produced from rocks that are, you know, the permeability of these rocks we're talking about is on the order of about 100 nanodarcies. It's a million times smaller a tip than a typical gas reservoir. So yeah, you'll have to do something. Now, my research group, it's a little hard to see, um, is heavily engaged in a variety of topics, including uh, shale gas development. And what I'm going to talk about today is the work of about four or five of these uh, individuals who are, they're as smart as they are good looking. So that's all I can say. And there are a lot of questions. Um, and I, I just want to talk about three today. The first, and I'm going to use this data set. Um, I should take a minute to explain it. It's the Barnett Shale, where it all began. There are five horizontal wells drilled from two surface locations. Each horizontal well is about 5,000 feet long and about 500 feet apart. And all the dots represent microearthquakes recorded during the hydraulic fracturing. And I'll show you a diagram later on. But to, first, to the first level, each well was hydraulically fractured exactly the same way. And yet what you can see are lots of little microearthquakes here, almost none here. And yet this well was hydraulically fractured 10 times, roughly every 300 feet or so along its length, as was this well. And the amount of fluid that was pumped was very similar and all the rest. So the re reservoir is responding very differently. So the three questions I want to address are first, can we improve the stimulation process? I mean, after all, we'd like to get as much gas out for as little effort as possible, just economic efficiency, but we want to drill the fewest number of wells, we want to do the least hydraulic fracturing, so on and so forth. So can we improve upon this of what's standardly done? Can we accurately estimate ultimate recovery? Now, the rule of thumb is that we're getting around 25% of the natural gas out when we, when we do something like this. When you ask people you know, how they came up with that calculation, of course, you have to have some idea of what the gas in place is at the beginning. And that's a very hard thing to determine in these very low permeability rocks. And you have to sort of put sort of an end mark, OK, that I've gotten all that recovery, and now I'm going to plug and abandon the well and, and move on. But um, there's some real fundamental questions about um, estimating this, this kind of simple and classic number that is used in petroleum engineering. And finally, when we look at, <coughs> excuse me, when we look at this global assessment of these tremendous resources, are they all going to be amenable to this kind of multi-stage hydraulic fracturing that's worked so well in the Barnett 
and has worked well in other parts of North America uh, to date. Now, this is data from the Barnett Shale. Uh, Peter Valco and John Lee are very well known and very experienced petroleum engineers. And what they found is if you look at well-to-well -well productivity in the Barnett, it, it's a real mess. The wells are highly, highly variable. So what they did is they took all the wells drilled in July of 2004, and this is the average well performance for those wells, and the production declines rapidly over the first couple years and then sort of flattens off. The wells drilled in July 2005 are shown here. The wells drilled in July 2006 are shown here. So it's very clear that industry was getting very smart very fast, and the wells were longer, the, there were more hydrofracks per well, each hydrofrac was done in a little bit more clever way, and in just this two-year period between 2004 and 2006, the wells are producing twice as much. Now, this rapid decline is really quite regrettable in the sense that it, what it really means is that you've got to earn back your investment and you know, you've got to keep drilling to keep producing gas. And that's part of the problem. That's not a very good business model. You'd like the wells to last longer, um, and that's something I'm going to get to a little bit later. Now, I'm going to give you my interpretation of what I call the standard paradigm. And you think a term like the standard paradigm would mean that there was some consensus about how this worked. After all, we've drilled 25,000 shale gas wells already. But there really isn't much of a consensus. But I'll tell you why I think it works more or less. And that is two things. One is the multi-stage fracturing that I talked about. But as this was being done, something else was being done that's largely escaped attention. And that is there was a switch from using these very complex, viscous gels to what's called slick water. It's basically water with a little bit of friction reducer, like a soap, okay, a little bit of biocide in it, a little bit of guar, the thickening agent, and ice cream to carry a little bit of propant. But basically, these are hydrofracs made with water. And the reason the water is important is because now the hydrofracs are acting as a conduit for high pressure water to get out into the formation, away from the well, and to in fact trigger slip on pre-existing little fractures and faults that are already in the shale. And that's what well, these little, this is, the, this is about the best art I have ever created, as pathetic as it is. <laughs> this is supposed to represent that, and so these little tick marks, these little sprinkles, are magnitude minus two earthquakes. And I'll, I'll show you what a magnitude minus two is if you find it hard to imagine. But they're tiny little events that can't be recorded unless you've got seismometers down hole. And the reason this works in sort of a standard context is somehow these, the, the cumulative effect of all these tiny little slip events are actually changing the permeability of the shale, raising it to a higher level than this 100 nano Darcy starting point and allowing the, gas, allowing the gas to flow. And all the hydrofrac is, is a way of getting that fluid pressure out into the reservoir and then of course, after that fact, getting the gas back uh, you know, to the well and eventually to the surface. So why does this shear, so the, the, the fact that the micro earthquakes tells us they're shear events, okay, but why does that enhance permeability? It enhances permeability because what we have in the formation uh, the Barnett Shale is 300 million years old. At first, the few, first few cores were reported by academia not to have any fractures in it, and well, then it had a few, but they were filled with calcite or even pyrite and other things in it. You know, there was no permeability. Well, in fact, what happens is that we take these old dead fractures, and by raising the fluid pressure, you know, a process we understand well, we reduce the effect of normal stress and allow fractures that wouldn't normally want to slip, we allow them to shear, and that creates porosity and permeability. So if you think about this as sort of an aperture or a permeability, um, you know, it's gonna decrease with effective stress once we lower the pressure and the effective stress goes up any given fracture, but if you induce that fracture to shear, you not only change sort of the effective aperture, but the damage you do in that shearing process keeps keeps that permeability even after the pressure is, is lowered. Something like that is, is basically 
the only way I can figure out why, why this process works. I dug through the literature and found a few examples. Uh, they're granitic rocks, they're not shales, but these are experiments where you know, people shear a pre-existing fault and they measure the permeability as a function of shear displacement at different normal stresses. And in these two different studies, the two different samples, two different confining pressures, you see about a two order of magnitude permeability, in this case permeability, uh, in this case hydraulic conductivity, but it's going up about two orders of magnitude as a result of shearing a few millimeters in, in, in both cases. It takes a few millimeters of slip to cause that damage to open up the fracture and, and result in this permeability enhancement. So the concept is reasonable. It's, um, you know, we, we need data like this on shales, but um, th this data would certainly support that hypothesis. The problem is there's really no good correlation between microseismicity and production. Uh, I'll come back to this study by uh, uh, my colleague Dan Moose and some others at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the talk. It's in the northeastern United States. There's a well here and a well directly beneath it with the seismic array, a series of hydraulic fractures. Some of the hydraulic fractures produce lots of microearthquakes, others hardly any, and there's no correlation. There's just as much, well, I'll show you what, I'll show you the lack of correlation later. Excuse me, but the amount of apparent damage to the formation is not correlating with the amount of gas that comes out. In the data I just showed you, uh, the data set I'm going to talk about and I just showed you before, these wells where there are lots of micro earthquakes being generated are no more productive than these, which hardly, hardly have any. This is um, 16 wells, eight drilled to the northwest, eight drilled to the southeast. These boxes indicate uh, hydraulic fracturing that wasn't recorded by the recording system, so that those are no data areas. But you can certainly see very dense microearthquakes along you know, these wells here, very few along these other wells, and there's no correlation with production. So somehow the, this standard paradigm is, is breaking down. So why, do, why, doesn't, why doesn't it work? Um, first, the, the, the microearthquakes appear to be too small to affect permeability. What, you know, what is a magnitude minus two, oops, minus two earthquake? So I took some standard relations from earthquake seismology that relate the magnitude of an earthquake to the size of the fault and the amount of slip that occurs. So the bigger the earthquake, of course, the bigger the, bigger the fault. And we all have kind of, an, especially those of us living here in California, you know, we, we feel magnitude three to fours. Um, moderate damage as earthquakes approach, you know, magnitude six, and when we get around magnitude seven or eight, you, you know, you really want to be on a business trip when they happen. Okay, we know that. But as, you know, we, we look at the magnitude, there's a fault size, and there's an amount of slip on that fault, depending on the stress drop. And the stress drops range between about 10 megapascals and 0.1 megapascals. So an earthquake triggered by fluid injection in Arkansas, 4.7, was an earthquake on a patch a few kilometers in size, and it slipped you know, on the order of a centimeter or a few centimeters. The earthquake that closed down shale gas development in the UK, at least uh, uh, until now, a uh, magnitude 2.3 event, an event that which would not normally be seen, at, you know, be felt at the surface. You're talking about a, you know, a hundred meter patch and a millimeter of slip. And the magnitude minus twos we're talking about down here, you're talking about a patch size, probably less than a meter, and less than a tenth of a millimeter of slip. So one kind of annoying problem is how does such, such a small patch and such a small amount of slip enhance the permeability to produce the gas? And that, in fact, is the other problem, and that is that the total lock volume affected by the micro seismicity can't account for very much of the gas that's actually produced. And so I, I did this back of the envelope calculation. I assume that within a, a sphere, I think I took a two meter diameter, the rock was completely pulverized and we got every molecule of gas out of it. And then I, I you know, assume there were 4,000 4, of these events and I could accommodate, I could, you know, account for about you know, less than 1% of the total gas production. So there's something going on 
in the reservoir, not represented by the microseismicity. And what I uh, describe here as an alternative to the standard paradigm is that in addition to the slip associated with the microearthquakes, there is pervasive, slow slip on pre-existing faults and fractures that are, that are already in the reservoir, but they're slipping slowly. And they're, in fact, enhancing the reservoir permeability far more effectively than what we can account for with the microearthquakes. And this slip is not observed with standard microseismic monitor monitoring technologies. So let me uh, show you uh, our evidence for this and, in fact, um, why looking back, you know, kind of like a lot of things, once you've seen it, it's sort of like, oh yeah, well, we ought to, we should have seen it all along and, and what the implications. Now, our evidence for it is some very unusual seismic signals we are calling long, long period, long duration seismic events. And they look a lot, of, a, like, a lot like what's typically called tectonic tremor, which some of your colleagues are studying in Cascadia, on the San Andreas Fault, in subduction zones around the world. In uh, the leading edge last July, uh, July of 2011, a year ago, we reported our first observations. We've looked at four data sets, and we see these events in all four. Then I want to show you some lab work about why this slow slip is um, actually expectable from rate and state friction theory, and then show you some uh, other principles of sort of fault mechanics that sort of also suggest that, in fact, there ought to be a lot of slow slip around, and then conclude with, you know, what it all means for, for production. Now, this is a spectrogram, so it's just frequency versus time, and these vertical spikes are, in fact, microearthquakes. Uh, there were nine seismometers. Uh, there's nine seismometers. Each was a three-component seismometer, and you, you keep blowing up the data. And there are the P waves and the S waves, and these little microseismic events are, are recorded, located using all the standard te techniques of, of, of earthquake seismology. Um, if, you know, we have a one-meter patch, the rupture, you know, a seismic rupture propagation is about the shear wave velocity, two kilometers per second. The, you know, the event lasts for half a millisecond. Well, because of all the tectonic tremor being found around the world, we went looking for a similar signal in these data, and we actually found these long period, so now we're looking at a few tens of hertz, long duration, now we're looking at 60 seconds, these long period, long duration seismic events, which now we see here on a seismogram, that look a lot like what is seen in subduction zones on the deep San Andreas Fault um, and so on. And these events where, you know, they've been studied in great deal uh, in sort of academic seismology and geodesy are associated with large faults slipping very slowly and they generate these, these signals called tectonic tremor. And this is very similar to what we're seeing, and we think it, too, is caused by slow slip on large faults. And in the paper Indrajit Das and I uh, published, we have fracture orientation data over here. This is uh, uh, wells A, B, and C, three of the five wells. It's back toward the, uh, the heel of the well, so it's uh, frax ages seven, eight, and nine. These two wells were, were hydraulically fractured simultaneously, so the blue dots are the microearthquakes from stage seven, red dots from stage eight, green dots from stage nine. We, we can't locate precisely the long period, long duration events, but we can tell what direction they come from. And we've hypothesized, because of this preferred orientation of faults, that there are cross-cutting faults producing the LPLD events associated with stage seven, stage eight, or, or stage nine. So that was our interpretation. How big are they? It's kind of hard to measure, but we've been doing a variety of things. One thing we've done are some spectral ratios. So they're, they're about three times as big as a minus one. They're about 17 times as big as a minus 1.5, which makes them about magnitude zero earthquakes. And a magnitude zero earthquake is now, you know, occurring on a scale of tens of meters, although, you know, 
we have to worry about these relationships breaking down because the stress drop is extremely small in these events. But nonetheless, they're occurring on much, much larger faults. And the cumulative effect, you know, that's just one of them, the cumulative effect of all of them, we think, is enhancing the permeability. Um, Indrajit's preparing this paper for publication now. Um, and in looking at the LP, the events, just like tectonic tremor, he found a, little mic a few micro-earthquakes embedded in the sequence. And when he located those, there's one, two, and three. And these are separated, and they migrate in that direction over about a 20-second period. Um, and we were very happy to see this, because it was like you know just a little additional evidence that this slow slip on larger faults was, was actually occurring. So why should there be slow slip? We've been doing uh, lab research on a variety of shales, uh, Barnett, Haynesville, Eagleford. We've got some other measurements on other, on other samples. Um, we subdivide them into sort of high clay end members, which we call dark, and low clay end members, being, which are, we call light. And I'll, I'll talk about some different kinds of tests. What I want to talk about now is, is friction. Now, also in earthquake uh, mechanics, uh, the idea, uh, the, the theory of rate and state friction is, is very well established to inform us about what, you know, under what conditions faults will slide suddenly, like produce an earthquake, or slide slowly and just sort of creep along. And everyone's familiar with the, 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 the growth faults in the Gulf of Mexico, very pervasive, you know, sort of down to the Gulf. Uh, active normal faults, but there are never any earthquakes on them. They just kind of slip along um, to accommodate the, um, the downward motion of the big pile of sediments. So here's how rate and state friction works. So we have a saw cut in a lab sample under confining pressure. We slide that saw cut at a certain, a certain velocity, and we measure the friction on the fault. When you raise the velocity, you make it slide faster. The friction instantaneously goes up, but then recovers through this evolution effect to a level that's either higher or lower than the initial friction level. So this upper diagram is what we call stable sliding. Why? Because the higher the, the velocity, the stronger the fault. So the fault, if it tries to accelerate, it's suddenly resisted by more force. This is unstable because the evolution effect reduces friction to a lower level than it was initially. And so as the velocity goes up, the fault gets weaker, and that leads to this frictional instability. As I said, this is uh, it's a cottage industry in both laboratory studies and, and fault uh, theory. Uh, lots of people are doing it, and this basic framework is the same whether we're talking about reservoirs or, or crustal faults. These are our, our data for these shales. This is the coefficient of friction as a function of clay plus organic content. So we've, we've summed the weak constituents. Friction starts at 0.8 and gradually reduces to about 0.45. The more clay and organic content, the, the lower the friction. But what's really interesting is what this A minus B parameter is. And I should have drawn your, your attention to this. When A minus B is positive, it's stable sliding. When A minus B is negative, it's unstable or we get earthquakes. So low clay in organic matter, we have a negative A minus B. In other words, these low clay end members are expected to produce micro earthquakes when they slip. These high clay end members are expected to slide stably. So when we work on these samples, say we, we get samples of the Barnett shale, they're usually coming out of the same core barrel. So these Barnett dark samples are separated by a few meters from the Barnett light samples. And yet, even on that scale, we see some of it, you know, if there was a small fault sliding, it would have been stable. Some of it, if there was a small fault sliding, it would have produced a small microearthquake. The same is true of Eagleford. The same is true of the Haynesville. So this, this slight change in composition, which is really kind of describing the variability um, of the shale, is enough to go through a transition where we might expect microearthquakes, but you still have faults slipping, um, enhancing permeability, but there's, the faults are slipping so slowly you don't see any signal whatsoever. In my uh, reservoir geomechanics class, two students who were also taking a geostat class 
decided to take this, out, this idea out for a spin. And so in the five wells, there is um, gamma logs, which is really all they ever record for the directional drilling uh, while, they're, while they're doing the horizontal drilling. And the gamma log is uh, roughly um, correlative with the amount of clay, which uh, high clay is, is in red, low clay is in the, uh, the, lighter, the, the lighter colors. And, and what you can see is there's a pretty nice inverse correlation between where the micro earthquakes are and low clay and the high clay areas and where the micro earthquakes aren't. So our, our hypothesis is, is that the reason this well is just as productive as some of the other wells, and yet there are very few micro seismic events, is that you know, the, the, the faults were, were, slipping, were slipping stably and we just you know, didn't observe that. This shows the, the basic way in which these wells were, were hydraulically fractured. Um, these two were fractured simultaneously, these were us, uh, it's called zipper frack, it went back and forth, back and forth. This was done conventionally. We had the seismometers in this well until it was fractured and then it was moved to a, to a, a vertical well. So, you know, we, we treat the reservoir in sort of a very similar way um, and yet it responds in a very complex way and, um, and fundamentally we can't use the micro earthquakes to really tell us you know, what part of the reservoir is going to wind up producing gas. Now there's a second reason why slow slip should occur, and that actually strikes right to the heart of, of why this process works to begin with. Now this, this is a pretty complicated slide, but I, I think I can break it down for you. So these are the three, the A, B, C, D, the wells we've been talking about. The middle well, we have an image log, and so that's just the strike of the fractures that are encountered, their position, Okay, their dense and their orientation, at least their strike is shown there. We've determined the stress state, uh, the three principal stresses, and we can plot those fractures on a Mohr diagram, or we can plot them on a stereo net, and the color in the background is how much do we have to perturb the pore pressure to make them slip. Now, the initial state is that these are old, dead faults. You know, who knows when they were introduced into the, you know, into the rock. They're certainly not active today. They're, there's no reason to suspect they're particularly permeable. But as we go during hydraulic fracturing, as we raise the pressure, if we raise it a little bit, we can see a few are turned on. Now they're shown in red here or white here. We raise the pressure even more, and they're shown here in red and white there. And now we get we're about 95% of the frac radiant, okay? So the pressure is even higher than this right next to the fracture plane, but in the rock near the fracture plane, almost all of those pre-existing fractures, those previously dead fractures, have been turned on. They've been made to slip. And, and I think all of the things being equal, in other words, you have to have organic content, it has to have the right maturity, and so on, the ability to make these old dead faults slip is really the key to producing gas um, out of these reservoirs. But are these going to be seen microseismically? Well, I, I think not. And uh, we've done some calculations, but let me just show you a, a, an intuitive um, explanation of what I'm talking about. Suppose you have an old dead fault, and the maximum force that's acting on it is almost perpendicular to that fault. So it really doesn't want to slide. The ratio of shear to normal stress is very, very low, very high normal stress, very low shear. But if you were to intersect that fault in the middle for the sake of a simple calculation and put very high fluid pressure right there, you could make the fault slip. You could push the two sides apart and a little bit of shear stress can make it slip. But that slip can't propagate and it can't propagate because the fluid pressure is not acting over here. So the fault can't slip over its length any faster then the fluid pressure can propagate along it. And that's what we show here. So here's the initial fluid pressure profile, and then with time it spreads out, and as it spreads out, the displacement on the fault spreads out, but it's not at two kilometers a second. It's not the shear wave velocity. It's not going to be generating seismic waves. And so this, this fundamental process of making old dead faults slip is probably, in general, not going to be a seismogenic process. That's going to be a slow slipping event, even when there's, there's low clay uh, you know, in the formation. So, um, 
frankly, I think it's, it's a much bigger deal than, than, than what the micro-earthquakes tell us about. So if that's true, what do we do about it during the stimulation process? And I think, you know, how do we improve this? And th sometimes this is called factory fracking. There's a new phrase for you. And the idea is, you know, you own a piece of land, you drill the wells controlled by the stress orientation, you drill them so the fracks are perpendicular, and then you lay out a grid of fracks, just like was done here. You set up the trucks um, here or here, and then you go through this process as efficiently as possible. Now that's sort of standard practice, and yet the, the same people who do this will admit that probably 25 or 30 percent of the fracks is, are producing 90 percent of the gas. So it'd be nice not to kind of waste a lot of time, energy, and money fracturing in inappropriate places. And I think the appropriate places are the places where these fractures are, are more present than others. And this is the paper I alluded to before by uh, Dan Moose and others. Here's a, here's a well. This is the toe. It's the heel. The, um, it's a little bit different kind of fracturing. So these are the ports where the fluid enters the tubing. Those are the red circles. The, Blue shows you the number of earthquakes in each one of these stages. The red is the number of fractures and faults observed via an image log in the well. And the green is the flow. And the, the flow is correlating with the fractures, but not correlating with the micro-earthquakes. So you've got to make the faults slip. And if you make enough faults slip, they'll, they'll uh, flow. Can we accurately estimate ultimate recovery? Um, that's a really good question. You know, I showed you this in terms of the, the, the short duration of the wells and the improvement in efficiency in a short period of time. But one of the interesting things about these curves, in fact, the, the purpose for them writing this, this paper was to talk about the persistent production. You can see, look, the production is very flat through here. And this is not expected. And this is what the, uh, Valco and Lee were struggling with, is try to how to fit these data and then make longer term forecasts. What interests me is, you know, what's happening and why. And this persistent production is actually leading um, some gas producers to argue that the wells are going to last for 25 or 30 years. Now, a, they're going to produce gas at a low rate, but nonetheless, if they're, you know, there's plenty of wells, and if they are producing for 25 to 30 years, it's, it's going to be quite important. Is that true, or is it just hype? that the wells are going to last for 25 or 30 years. It's important. It's important for the economics, and it's important how we view gas development. Are these wells going to be drilled, produced, shut in a couple years later, and then move along? Or is this going to, are these going to be semi-permanent installations, and we have to think about protecting the environment for 25 or 30 years during the lifetime of these wells? And what we're looking at, the scientific part of that question is we're looking at whether or not the fusion and desorption are contributing to persistent production. That there's a transition from sort of Darcy flow and the easier perm that you've helped create through the stimulation process to a process to, to different you know, flow mechanisms. So here's, a, here's the Eagleford in South Texas. There's a little bit of kerogen. Uh, the flat spots there are just sample preparation. If we look a little bit closer and a little bit closer, there's the porosity inside the carriage, and this is a, about 100, 150 nanometers across. And it has been argued that the principal flow mechanism in these shales was flow through the pores inside the waxy organic material that's actually producing the gas. Now, I was very skeptical of this, but I actually think, for the reasons I'm about to show you, that that is really what is happening. This is some, uh, very hard to see in, in this bright light, but this is from a, a micro CT, and the green shows where the kerogen is, and the red shows the porosity, and at this scale, where you can start to kind of connect the kerogen bodies um, in the sample, um, it really does look like most of the porosities in the kerogen, but we've got some better data than that. Um, first, is desorption important? Well, these desorption isotherms, um, which, we have done and added to uh, data in the literature do demonstrate that if you get the pressure down low enough, there ought to be a lot of gas desorption. Now, we don't know that we're seeing desorbed gas when we produce it, 
But if, in fact, the pressures are getting down to a few hundred PSI, and you're dropping those pressures over a significant volume, you know, part of the volume affected by those five wells, there's a lot of gas there to be produced. Is Newton diffusion important? You know, is there kind of sort of molecular slippage along the walls uh, contributing to the flow? Well, you know, when the gas density is low and the pore dimensions are very small, theoretically we should, we should expect it. Now, I first ran into Newton diffusion by a different name. Um, when I was doing permeability measurements as part of my PhD thesis, and it was called the Klinkenberg effect. And the Klinkenberg effect was, in fact, an environmental correction. If you wanted to measure permeability with gas for simplicity, but you were e actually interested in the liquid permeability, you had to be careful about what pressure the gas was at. And if the gas was at too low a pressure, you got an anomalously high permeability. Okay? So this is one over pressure. So what you do is you make a series of permeability measurements at different pressures, and then you extrapolate to infinite pressure, and that actually gives you the liquid, liquid permeability. And that was demonstrated first by Klinkenberg in 1941. Well, I didn't worry about this too much. I, I was making measurements at really high pressures, and so it was just, just a nuisance. But you know, some of the, some of the things that um, you think about in your thesis come back to haunt you later on. And, and now we're going to try to put the Klinkenberg to use. We made a, a, a number of measurements. There, these are low permeability rocks. It takes a long time, uh, multiple pressures and different gases and, and so on. So this is. Um, Looking at the effective stress, okay, the difference between the external confining pressure and the pore pressure, and as the effective stress goes up, the permeability goes down. And these are three different Eagleford samples. The H means it's flowing parallel to the bedding, uh, excuse me, to Eagleford, and this is a Marcellus perpen perpendicular to the bedding. And you know, look at the numbers here. You know, this is 80, 60, 40 nanodarcies. And these are very low permeability rocks. But the pore pressures we used were fairly high. The Klinkenberg effect shouldn't be very important. When we drop the pore pressure, and now we can see the, the effective stress effect, we can also see the amplification of permeability by this Knudsen diffusion or Klinkenberg process. And so we can isolate at any given effective stress, we can isolate that, draw lines like Klinkenberg did, determine the permeability, but more importantly, estimate the pore sizes that the flow is coming from. Okay, now you know, I'm just flashing this up, but basically um, this is, this is well-established theory from, from the literature. We've not, we, we've not created it. We've, we're simply taking advantage of it, and what we want to do is look at the size of the pores that correspond to the kinds of signals that we're seeing when we lower the pressures to the point where this process should be important. And when we do that, this, this is the Eagleford. We're backing out pore sizes on the order of 100, 150 nanometers, the same, the same size as the pores that we actually imaged in the SEMs. And these matches aren't, aren't bad either. So it really does look like we're, we're looking at a very unusual flow system, totally dependent on the organic content and totally dependent on these extremely small pores to produce the gas that, you know, um, uh, that, that we're observing. The other question then is how important is this Newton diffu diffusion? And that depends on the pore pressure. And as these reservoirs deplete and as the pore pressure gets low, what this is the ratio of the Newton flow to the Darcy flow, what we can see is that if you're at low effective stress, medium, high effective stress, high effective stress, but low pore pressure, the Newton flow is three times as important as the Darcy flow. It's very, very important, but you know, are the pressures really getting down to a couple hundred PSI when they start at a few thousand PSI, and are they getting that low you know, inside the pores? Um, we don't know, and these are our first, you know, our first measurements of this type. In other cases, uh, you know, the amplification is not nearly as large, but you know, it's still not trivial, and the Newton flow is 50% of the Darcy flow. Well, that's, that's good, that's, you know, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a plus. The, the, you know, the, the, the diffusion is, in fact, enhancing the flow at these, these low 
these low pressures. So the, the question is, you know, whether or not these, will last, these wells will last 25 or 30 years. Well, ask me in 20 years, and I'll know the answer for sure. Um, but, you know, there are reasons to suspect that, you know, maybe it's not crazy, and maybe, you know, these are the kinds of processes that are, that are flattening out the production that we, we can observe, you know, in this very short, you know, time period that, that this whole thing has been going on. And as we study it more and as more data becomes available and as we try to model this in more detail, I think we'll have more confidence in, in what the answer to this important question happens to be. The final thing I want to talk about this afternoon is, okay, we, we came up with something in the, you know, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's been applied broadly you know, throughout North America. It's beginning to be applied uh, around the world. Uh, you know, China has enormous potential shale gas resources, but there have only been 60 wells drilled in the entire country, and we, we you know, really don't know uh, what's going on. And we look at the rest of the world, you know, will this basic strategy work, you know, our, you know for all of these uh, organic rich shales uh, that we, we, we saw on this, this map? Well, you know, when maps like this are made, and the, the yellow, this kind of mustard color is the, the shale gas part of the of the uh, uh, technically recoverable gas. As these maps are made, what people are paying attention to is the organic content, and it only takes a few percent, and the maturity, which, of course, you know, if it's very mature, it's gonna produce gas. If it's less mature, it's gonna produce uh, gas plus liquids. So these are the things being looked at as maps and assessments like that are being made. But is that all that's kind of important? And we have a clue that maybe there's a few little things to worry about. Um, and that clue came from the Floyd Shale. The Floyd Shale here in uh, Mississippi and Alabama was a complete bust. A number of companies went in, they drilled wells, drilled them horizontal, did the fracking, experimented with the fracking, and could never produce anything close to economic quantities of natural gas and basically abandoned the play. There's very little data out there on the Floyd Shale but I fortunately got to speak to someone who actually was, was spending his money doing it and decided to pull the plug. I told you before that we're you know, experimenting with different amounts of clay. Uh, in addition to the different kinds of rock mechanics that we're doing, we also do creep tests. In other words, when we load it hydrostatically and then we load it triaxially with a load on the end, we hold the load to look for time-dependent creep. And we do that at, at stress levels well below the point where the sample is going to fail, okay? So we don't want to introduce damage. We want to look at intrinsic viscoplasticity. And we can, we can see that time-dependent creep at these different hold levels during these, these rock mechanics tests. And I'm just going to ignore all the rest and, and focus on that. Um, here's an example. We load the sample fast. We, we stop loading it, and the sample just creeps along. And, you know, in sort of a cartoon form, if, you know, a viscoplastic material, if you hold the stress level, it's going to creep as a function of time. If you hold the deformation, the stresses will relax as the sample flows, okay? So, you know, how important is this? Well, as we began to experiment with these different rocks, what we found is that in most of these clays, there was just a little bit of viscoplasticity, not very much at all. But in this, in this Haynesville, where the clay contents are higher, when we got up to about 40% clay, there was much more viscoplasticity, okay? So remember that while we're observing this, a viscoplastic material not only will deform ductally, but the stresses, the stresses to drive slip on faults, the stresses to control hydrofract propagation, these stresses that are intrinsic to the you know, production of, of shale using this multi-stage fracturing process, those stresses are relaxing away and disappearing. So if a material is too viscoplastic, you know, it is not gonna be amenable to production, to, to stimulation in the, in, the, in the same way. So we've been determining the constitutive laws. We, we, we have to, we have to um, you know, do some long period tests and we've been doing that. We've, we think we've determined the correct power law for, for, for the creep. And then we build it into various um, sort of geodyna geodynamic models. We load the crust in different ways and we see what the stresses happen to be in terms of these empirical coefficients. This is basically one over Young's modulus. 
and n is this uh, exponent on the power law. It turns out that these are the low clay rocks over here, low B and low N, and these are the high clay rocks over here, high B and high N. And when we subject this to a model, we can predict how much stress the sample can hold. And it turns out that if there's low clay, you know, the rocks are almost behaving elastically, it can hold, you know, a few thousand PSI. If there's high clay, it can barely hold 100 PSI. And, and so these stress differences are just disappearing as the sample tends to flow as one would, would predict. And we've, we've done different loading histories. They, it, loading history really doesn't matter. It's, it's the shale. And it suggests that as we, you know, look, you know, around the world, we shouldn't forget the Floyd shale. And if we look at its composition, the thing that really makes it stand out is its clay content. It's 45 to 65 percent clay as compared to the other places. And I think we have to look at these global assessments and worry about how many Floyd shales are out there because we could be, we could be very wrong about the potential of, of some of these uh, shales to produce large quantities of gas. And, and we just have to do the work and, and, and find out. So I want to I wanna conclude by saying uh, a couple things about the environmental impact of shale gas development. Um, you know, um, it's in the news every single day. And um, the phrase has been used, and I, I like the phrase, except I, I remembered that I mistyped it, but I didn't remember to go back and fix it. Is shale gas a blue bridge to a green future? Okay, you know, are, you know, are we gonna make good use of these resources? Are we gonna develop them appropriately? And of course, there's, um, you know, uh, movie stars on TV all the time uh, complaining about hydraulic fracturing. Maybe if they knew that it meant so much to me, they wouldn't do that. I don't, I don't know. Um, um, but they're, you know, they're experts in their field. And um, every time something goes wrong, every truck that turns over, you know, it's no fracking, no fracking. The point is that, you know, shale gas development does have impacts and they should not be taken lightly. And, and basically, the gas industry took, took this whole issue much too lightly for, for at least five years. And so the conversation has been dictated by um, people with exaggerated claims and I think uh, very poor um, evidence of what some of the uh, real problems are. And there are real problems, but you know, as it turns out, hydraulic fracturing is not one of them. And you know, we're just at the beginning. What we've done in North America is now you know, being uh, you know, to be replicated around the world. And people look to the United States for establishing standards for doing things properly. And, uh, and properly doesn't mean only getting the gas out, but it means getting the gas out uh, and doing the least environmental damage as, as, as possible. And the stakes are even higher. You know, when I was here a couple years ago uh, talking about the potential of shale gas development, I use the slide like this. You've probably seen it um, many times. And it shows, basically, uh, that natural gas is far cleaner than you know, other fossil fuels. And basically, it's about two to one for CO2 uh, with respect to coal. And then wouldn't it be a great step forward if we could switch all these old coal-burning power plants to natural gas and really reduce CO2 emissions? Well, what's happened, of course, is that hypothetical argument has been realized. And now, instead of the great majority of, uh, well, something like 50% of our um, natural, uh, our electricity coming from, from coal and about 30% from natural gas, there's now roughly parity. And these are, you know, CO2 emissions uh, for making, for generating coal from an excess of 2 billion metric tons a year down to about 1.5, and cumulative, you know, U.S. CO2 emissions are at the lowest level in 20 years. So in the short term, this is a very important way to address, you know, the, 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 the greenhouse gas problem. It works, it's easily implemented, and it can, it can operate at literally global scale. Okay, and so we, we've seen it in the United States and, and we can see it happening um, in other places. 
but it kind of raises the stakes on doing it right. Now, you're not doing it right just because an oil company is trying to make some money by developing you know, gas resources um, in your backyard, and we have to regulate that process. Well, that's a normal part of uh, the way things work. But now, natural gas really is capable of fulfilling you know, one of its great advantages, and that is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so I was very pleased to be able to serve on this uh, Secretary of Energy Committee that, uh, that Don mentioned earlier on. Uh, the UK, uh, the Royal Society has had a uh, committee look at this as a, well, largely as a result of that magnitude 2.3 earthquake. And now uh, I'm participating with uh, a Canadian uh, Council of Academies panel uh, doing the same thing. Two of the three groups have concluded that shale gas resources can be developed while protecting the environment. And we, you know, in the case of this, these reports, we laid out those things that need to be done to do a better job than we've done in the past. It's not easy, the regulation is mostly done on the state level, and getting the states to do things right is, is, is often a challenge. Um, it's a long story, but it's an important one. And, of course, the same story is going on in the UK, the same story is going on in, in Canada right now, and that same story will play itself out in in China, Russia, South America, um, Australia, all the places where these shale gas resources exist. So do I think shale gas um, is going to be a blue bridge um, to a green future? Um, absolutely, I do. Uh, it's the best thing we can do in the next 30, 40 years, to mid-century at least. Uh, you know, when renewables are of appreciable scale, when the potential for new nuclear technologies uh, can be realized. In the next 20, 30, 40 years, it's the best thing out there for, for reducing uh, emissions. But it's not going to happen unless we do a better job of optimizing production. Just sort of this, you know, two-year-old wells and then shut them in and then drill some more is just crazy. It doesn't, it's not good for anybody. And we, we have to do better than that. And we have to do a better job of protecting the environment during production and development. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer your questions. Oh, sorry. Sure. I was at an SPE workshop a couple months ago looking at some of the temperature data from these multi-stage hydrofracks, and I was struck by how few sort of inflow points characterized by the Joule-Thompson cooling there were. It seemed like even on a 20-stage multi-frac, you're, you're limited to maybe 20 or 30 points where you actually see the cooling, the temperature signal of gas flow into the well. Can you put that into the context of the geomechanics? Well, I, you know, the, the pro, the, you know, we're working with rather ideal data sets, for example, that an image log is recorded along one of the horizontal wells so we know where the fractures are and we can talk about the conditions under which slip would be induced and therefore they'd have a beneficial uh, effect on gas production. So in, my hope would be, you know, if this story kind of holds together, had we that kind of data in advance, we could have done a better job of predicting where the gas would have come from, and we might have skipped 15 of those stages, which ultimately we're not going to be producing much gas anyway. And there's, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence from tracer tests, from spinner flow meters, from temperature uh, data like, you, like, like you're talking about, all of which seems to indicate that a relatively few number of the frac stages are producing the great majority of gas. And so the question is why? And I think it's because that's where the stimulation process, the process of, of making old dead faults slip, is, is the most effective. We, by the way, we have our first data sets uh, to, test, to test that idea where we actually have the, the temperature and flow data and we have everything else. So we'll be able, uh, it's a data set we're just getting started on now. So hopefully we'll be able to answer that question with an example here in the not distant future. Uh, you said that the U.S., Canada, and England had all commissioned reports on shale gas and that two out of three countries had recommended moving forward. Which was the country that didn't and what were the key issues on which those reports split? Oh, uh, the, Cana the Canadian process just began and there's, it's just in process. So they didn't conclude anything. But I think France and Bulgaria have a moratorium now. Um, 
I haven't actually looked into the reasons why. So. Uh, it seems like there's no doubt it's a huge resource, and there's large areas across the continents that have this resource. Can you make some comments on what kind of well density is needed to extract the methane that's present relative to the traditional uh, reservoirs, the standard ones that we've been exploiting for nearly 100 years? Um, let me, qualitatively, the answer is we're talking about drilling far more wells than we're, than we're used to drilling. And that it, the well spacing I showed you, 500 feet apart, I think that corresponds to a, a 20 acre spacing or something in normal oil field jargon. Uh, but those wells are too close. Those wells were interfering with each other. Um, so something more like 1,000 feet. But these are the things, as, as the companies are drilling their thousands of wells, these are the things they're experimenting with. You know, um, and this is why they use the micro seismic to try to guess how far apart to put the wells, whether the fractures are propagating vertically, and, and so on. And so they, they kind of tune that in the first you know, few hundred wells uh, when they get into an area and decide what to do. But, but um, you know, the, the fact is, you know, we're talking about many, many wells. And so when you, you talk about the environmental impact in, say, western Pennsylvania, you've got to recognize that somebody, and this is, our committee, you know, pointed to this. One of, the, one of the biggest environmental problems that no one is addressing is the cumulative impact of all those wells and associated infrastructure, or the other side of that is no one is looking at that development in sort of a holistic way to try to minimize that, minimize the number of roads, minimize the number of transmission lines, minimize the number of pipelines, manage water on a watershed basis, right? Everything's permitted on a, you know, I want to do this, and you meet the regulations, and you get, you know, you get a check mark, and off you go. But if you're going to drill thousands of wells, you know, in a few counties, then somebody needs to stand back and say, okay, all right, let's do this but let's do it in the smartest way possible instead of in sort of a haphazard way possible. So in the entire regulatory process, there's no place where that gets done. And, 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 and we, we talked about it at, at some length in our report because we thought it was really something that needed to be addressed. Yeah, what, what you said about uh, slow slipping uh, fault, uh, taking up major production kind of is counter to hydrologic thinking, and it also counter with higher clay content, and also counter to what you said about a Floyd Shale, too, where you would expect when you have higher clay content, you won't have that much of a permeability to sustain. And the, the other thing is what Barry mentioned about, uh, you know, very few inflow points based on temperature measurement, and it's all known at least among uh, fracture hydrologists, uh, field hydrologists, that there's no correlation between fracture density and actual fracture permeability. They have to be connected. When you see a bunch of uh, micro seismic uh, popping up, yeah, when you are stimulating, it's connected. But after stimulation, they end up slipping. Locally, you may have uh, uh, in enhanced permeability, but in the end, you have to have a connected permeability to sustain the production. So uh, it's not necessarily in that those pre-existing faults that with higher clay contents giving you inflow points, unless, I guess you've seen it in the flow survey along with wellbore where you see those faults correlating with the uh, production. I'm not quite sure I understood your question, and I agreed with at least half the things you said as I understood it. Um, but, it, you know, there is flow coming from somewhere in rock that has 100 nanodarcy matrix permeability. The unperturbed reservoir has a lot of old, sealed, dead faults. And I would argue that if you're raising the fluid pressure in multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, that process is affecting the permeability somehow. I don't think it's affecting the matrix perm. I think it's affecting the permeability of those fractures. So you are stimulating slip, and that's, res that's a result of the, that's why the hydraulic fracturing process works 
And that's why classical gel fracking, where you just have a big fat frack full of propent, doesn't work in these extremely low permeability rocks. Just having more surface area from a single fracture plane is, is not sufficient. So um, I think it is the fractures, and I think you, know, you have to wake them up. They've been dead a very long time. And I think that when you're pumping at the least principal stress, just simple fault mechanics shows you that you can, you can make almost any fault slip. That, that's a very, very high pore pressure. So when you're close to that fracture plane, anything that's there is going to want to slip. Am I next? <laughs> okay. um, so this summer at the uh, Goldschmidt uh, geochemistry meeting in Montreal, which is not far from Pennsylvania, I guess, so they did have a special session and talked about uh, gas development. It had to do with this estimate of the resource. And um, the comment that I heard that stuck in my mind was that, uh, like in the Marcellus, and I think also in the Barnett, uh, and maybe in some of the places in the Northwest there, they, they found as they developed the field that that whole area isn't sort of equally productive, that there are sort of hot spots within it, and in the end, most of the activity is focused on, a, on an area that's only like one-tenth or 20 percent maybe of that, of that total area. Yeah, they're actually referred to as the sweet spots. And in the Barnett Shale, there's kind of a, a fairway that runs right through the middle that's by far the most productive. And as you go to the sides, um, lots of people who got into the game late <laughs> lost a lot of money because the wells are far less productive. So there are always these sweet spots. And I think it has to do with it's their compositional issues. The organic content has to be there. It could have something to do with maturation. And it, I think a lot of it has to do with the inheritance of structures that can be uh, reactivated uh, appropriately. And, and um, you know, that, that game is, re that, or that question is fundamental to the whole development game of trying to predict ahead of time where those sweet spots are going to be. Those are the leases you want. That's where you want to do your drilling and concentrate your production. So it's, it's very true. I think that the percentage, you know, it may vary from, and it's only after the fact that you really know the answer, but there's certainly good spots and bad spots. No question about it. I was curious about um, up here. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, okay. It's really, it's really uh, hard to see. About the long-term um, question you raised, the 10, 20, 25 years, and then the, uh, the uh, possibility that diffusion, desorption, and uh, could contribute much more than permeability. But I'm wondering about the conceptual model then. You would still have to have fracture pathways into your wells in addition to diffusion into those fracture pathways, right? And then comes my question, if that's the conceptual model, how do, you, how do these fractures keep open in an environment where you don't actually frack anymore, where, you're, where you tend to have closure, and, and isn't that the limit, really, rather than diffusion desorption? Yeah, that, that's, that's an absolutely terrific question. The, the shearing we know is kind of in keeping the, pressure, the permeability high when the pressure is dropped, at least for a short term. How long it will stay high is not known. The same thing happens with the hydrofracts themselves. In fact, there's a, a, a process called propent embedment, where they think that the, these fractures will slowly close because the propent goes into the sidewalls, basically, and the hydrofracts close. And because of both of these uh, processes, people have been experimenting with going into an old well and refracking it, okay? And this has had mixed success. There's certainly been some very uh, dramatic uh, improvements uh, published in the literature, and, and what's happening now is because of the extremely low gas price, there's very little experimentation with that going on. But I think that's one thing we can look forward to. And, you know, if the gas price, if the, if the well's already drilled, if the gas price can support you know, repressurization of the same well to rejuvenate things which may slowly kind of close up with time, then it's a good thing to do. But people aren't experimenting it, you know, experimenting with it right now because gas prices are so low. But that's exactly what you're going to see in these thousands of wells as gas prices uh, start to rebound, you know, due to increased markets. Okay, I think we're going to um, end the session. I want to thank our speaker uh, one more time for a very interesting talk that's given us a lot more insight 
into what still seems like a magical process. You drill a <laughs> hole and the gas comes out. So uh, let's give our speaker a good hand. Thank you.